Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for spending this Friday evening here with me listening about 5G and health and what the science tells us. My slides are always very, very busy. There is lots of text, but all these slides will be tonight available on my blog between rock and hard place. So no need to take too many notes if one is interested. Okay, so I'm thinking that I am expert. So first of all, do I have education? As was already mentioned, I have some education, molecular biology, biochemistry. I'm currently adjunct professor of biochemistry in Helsinki and chief editor of Radiation and Health. In the past, I spent 22 years working at STUK. This is Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority in Finland and part of time as head of radiation biology lab, part of time as research professor. I had also sabbatical appointments in, at Harvard, Zijiang and Swinburne universities. Then I'm considered also expert by peers who invited me to do different things. So for example, I testified starting in 2009 with US Senate and other organizations that asked me of my opinions. What was already mentioned, I was member of this expert group that in 2011 classified cell phone radiation as possible carcinogen and I advised many other organizations around the world. So 5G technology. This, is, this will be combination of existing already 3G, 4G technologies and new millimeter waves technology. So it will be expanded, but it will be not completely new. This what we had so far, this one, two, three, four Gs will change into 5G, where not only cell phones will be, but everything around us, anything what has electricity in it will be connected to net one huge network, this so-called Internet of Things. So your coffee maker, your electric toothbrush, everything will be connected to this Internet of Things. At least these are the plans. And there are a few things about uh, 5G technology that are different from previous technologies. First of all is millimeter waves. So they will be used uh, not only, but also in, in addition, millimeter waves, which are somewhere between 30 to 300 gigahertz. There will be small cells because big cell towers will not be enough because millimeter waves cannot pass through many, uh, many obstacles and therefore we'll need many small cells in different locations in order to receive phone calls. Massive MIMO, it means about that cell towers in order to handle huge amount of data that will be generated by this Internet of Things, they need to be huge, massive cell towers also. Be informing that right now information coming to our cell phone is emitted just into air, whereas in 5G technology it will be beam that will be focusing on you personally with your cell phone when phone call is coming to your cell phone. And finally, fi full duplex, it means that right now technology permits that uh, gadgets can either listen or talk. So I can either can send information or receive, whereas full duplex will permit simultaneously sending and receiving information, meaning speeding, uh, uh, transfer of information. So this is this what will be changing. So far we were using mostly up to 6 gigahertz uh, uh, spectrum. This part was more or less empty, 6 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And now it will be filled up also this spectrum and part of it from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. Th these are those millimeter waves. So problems with millimeter waves, they have this advantage that they can transfer huge amount of information very rapidly and, and uh, very easily. 
but they have a problem. They go, don't go through walls of your buildings. They will not penetrate. In park, trees absorb them. They will not reach you. If there is rainy weather, fog, mist in air, microwaves will be absorbed by this, by this water. So this is a this is big problem with millimeter waves. Small cells, why we need so many small cells? So those big cell towers or those uh, antennas that we see on buildings, mounted on buildings, are not enough. Because if we go to park, this big antenna will not help us to get phone calls because trees will be dampening signal and our cell phones will not receive this signal. Therefore, in park, besides this one big antenna, we need many small cells in order to, for the signal to go around the trees and reach our phone. And this same, of course, applies, for example, in buildings where millimeter waves don't pass through walls. Therefore, in your living room, possibly you will need some microcell in order to receive phone calls. Mm. Ah, sorry. And now this massive MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. So from antennas that, are, that we know already, big ones, there will be huge antennas. Of course, those, those um, antennas itself will look slightly differently. But anyway, there will be huge antennas in order to handle this massive uh, uh, exchange of information. And there is a problem with, with safety limits that uh, why it is not possible anymore to lower safety limits, for example, for cell towers, what sometimes people are concerned that, that they are 24 seven exposed to cell tower radiation. Whether it has any health effects or not, it is still open question. But if we think that ICNIR safety limits are being used for cell towers, then this is this green yellow color. When antenna is mounted on roof of the buildings, it is everything okay because this area around antenna is, is there is radiation higher than safety limits permit, but whole building is clear of this. But, for example, in India, has been done several years ago, change, where people were complaining about too high exposures for, from cell towers, and telecoms were saying, all right, but our antennas emit 10 times less radiation than safety limits permit. So, they were asked, why don't you lower this safety limit? It will not change anything, but at least it will look on paper nicer. And so they have done it. And instead of safety limits uh, suggested by ICNIR, they made it one tenth of it. But if you un in place antenna with this one tenth safety limits on roof of the building, top of the building, is not in compliance with safety limits. There they are exceeded. And if you would think that you make 100 of ICNIR limit, what some people say, what if we make 100 so it is very low radiation? Well, if you make 100 and put it on top of the building, whole building is not for living because it is <coughs> not in compliance with safety limits. So, if somebody is telling, as I recently heard also here in, in New Zealand, that right now in New Zealand is being deployed technology that is not using millimeter waves, so there will be no millimeter waves in New Zealand. No, this is not so. Point is that right now this 5G that is being deployed is 5G that emits radiation below 6 gigahertz. They are not yet millimeter waves, but and the question is why? Because they are not yet ready. Technology is not made. So it is so that right now those 5G technologies are emitting radiation up to 6 gigahertz. So meaning this radiation what we already met in, in our life with 3 and 4G technologies, 
but later on when this gets full and millimeter wave technology to make both antennas and cell phones will be developed then they will be deployed so within next five years millimeter waves will be also here in New Zealand no worries and of course there is one thing this is person who is principal radiation protection scientist for in, in UK government agency and this person is already saying it is possible that there may be a small increase in overall exposure when 5G is deployed. So if government uh, scientists is saying that there might be a small increase, you can be sure that there will be some increase. So uh, health effects of 5G that will be combination of health effects of 3G and 4G supplemented with the health effects caused by millimeter wave exposures. And well, let's start with definition of, of health by World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. It is extremely broad definition, not everybody likes it. And not merely absence of disease or, or infirmity. And then when we look what kind of human health effects can be caused by this wireless technology first is user and overuse of devices leading to psychological addiction this is already a problem in some countries for teenagers in Japan in Korea they have a treatment for addiction to mobile devices in young people then another thing is worry about possible either imagined or real health effects caused by this radiation. So many people who are exposed to, for example, cell tower radiation, they think that it is causing in, for them some health effects because they get some kind of symptoms. So just worry whether this is caused or not is already health effect. Then, of course, it's possible health effects of radiation itself, radiation emitted by wireless communication devices. So, according to WHO definition of health, number one and number two are already health effects induced by wireless communication deployment. This health effect listed as three this caused by emission of radiation, this is still under debate how significant it is. So here is something about our knowledge from very person from US Secretary of Defense. It was a matter of many, many evening jokes in, in, in TV in US. But in fact, when reading this, it is excellent, perfect definition of knowledge. There is nothing missing. We know what we know. There are, we know what we don't know. And there is this part, we don't know, we don't know. There are some things that we don't know still there is some knowledge that we are not aware about. And when we set human health policies, they are based solely on what we know that we know. So meaning on this published science, this we know. But what we know that we don't know, we don't use in this setting health policies. And this is a problem because this means that, for example, research that has not been done is dismissed as irrelevant. Some time ago, it was possible to hear about children and people were asking, what about health effects on children? Then answer was coming very often, but we don't have any evidence that children would be affected by cell phones. But the real answer should be, we don't have evidence because no single study was published on this. So this is something that we know that we don't know, but we avoid it and, and we don't use it in thinking about our health policies. And of course, there is this problem with our knowledge that anything that questions status quo, current status quo, and could lead to implementation of precautionary measures is labeled as scaremongering. 
So it is not only this that somebody is saying we are in danger, so he is a scaremonger. No, I've been labeled by Michael Pacioli as a scaremonger when I say we don't know enough, we should do research. And finally, this process of evaluation of science and recommendation of health policy has been has been, and is missing, um, has been taken over by private clubs. And uh, here it is, ah, still a couple of words about research approach. When we are thinking about science and, and published science, we should confirm in human volunteers existence of effects observed in vitro and in animal studies. This is of paramount importance. It is not enough that we observe some effect in cells grown in laboratory or in animals. We should confirm to ethical degree the same, whether the same effects occur in real people. And there is common mistake, this overinterpretation of this in vitro and animal data to suggest without human volunteer data that effects observed in vitro and in animals prove health effects in humans. They are not. They are indicating possibility, but they are not proof. And of course, crucial questions to answer are, are there phys physiological effects of cell phone radiation occurring in humans? And are those effects strong enough to alter human physiology in a way that could lead to health effects? Because the fact that radiation induces biological effect doesn't equal that this biological effect is health effect. And here is about those private clubs, and they are on both sides of, of, of debate. It is this, mm, sorry. ICNIRP, International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, is very powerful, which is dictating to the whole world safety limits, safety standards, and another countermeasuring bioinitiative, also another private club. They are prone to provide skewed evaluation of scientific evidence because current members of these organizations elect new members of organizations. Nobody is controlling those organizations. And skewed science evaluation is because of the close similarity of the opinions of all members. If all members in a group have the same opinion, yes, there is health effect, or no, there is no health effect, there is nobody else to challenge them within this group. So ICNIR arrives always at beautiful consensus no, there is no problem whatsoever. Bioinitiative always arrives at consensus. Yes, there is a big problem. So this, but it is not only this that skewed evaluation of science, because then this skewed evaluation of science leads to skewed si safety guidelines and skewed health policies. So we are paying for it later. So ICNIP considers only thermal effects. This is problems with safety uh, standards that we have also here. Any equipment that is radiating below current safety standards is automatically considered safe. And that's why you can go to shop, you can buy Wi-Fi equipment, you can put it wherever you like, it should be safe. It is safe, yeah? Then compliance with safety standards is used as excuse to stop research. Because if it is everything, all equipment is safe, not to, so why bother with new research? We have other things that we should study. So that's the problem. Uh, Non-thermal effects exist, but I refuse to be acknowledged by ICNIRP. So ICNIRP's safety limits considers only thermal effects. This that exposure would increase temperature. But there are also exposures, and there is a lot of research on this, where temperature is not really not rising or not as much as ICNIP says. And for example, epidemiology studies and sleep EEG studies provide compelling evidence for the existence of non-thermal effects, because those effects observed in epidemiology on sleep EEG studies should not exist. And of course, um, 
fact that ICNIRP claims that safety limits protect everyone, no matter what. But there is a question. Something to jump to, to medication and in old age. Recently, a few days ago, was British Guardian published article, elderly people being poisoned by medication, say drug experts. And what is interesting here, that too little is known about how drugs affect older people, and elderly patients are being poisoned with medication because too little is known about how different drugs interact with each other and correct dosages for older people. So it means that pharmaceutical industry maybe acknowledges, or at least it is being acknowledged here, that we don't have information, we don't have science to say that when we have medication that works on middle-aged people, that it will work the same way on old people. We didn't do this research. We just assumed that it will be the same kind of medication working on, the, on different age people. And with ICNIRP and, and old age, ICNIRP has also organizations that has no single physician on its staff. They are deciding about health effects, but there is no single physician and there never has been single physician. And they claim that safety limits protect everybody, no matter age or health status. But this claim is just assumption because there is no research that would address these issues. There is no research on this, whether old people or whether babies or whether people giving different kind of medication, getting different kind of medication or people with different kind of diseases, whether they respond the same way to safety limits or not. So it is only assumption. So health in 3 and 4G technologies that have been around already for, for some time, since late 80s. So this is what is most well known is impact or, or effects of this radiation on development of cancer. And carcinogenicity was evaluated by IARC, this International Agency for Research on Cancer. First evaluation was in 2011, and it was classified as two B, group 2B, possibly carcinogenic to humans. So it means that there was limited evidence in humans and insufficient evidence in animals. Next evaluation will be in 20, by 2025. This year in spring was decided that it will be uh, re-evaluated this, this stat status of, of carcinogenicity. Ongoing are also ed evaluations by ICNIRP itself and WHO EMF project, which will be most likely published in 2020. This what ICNIRP will, will do is, is um, I will hear on 2nd of December in Melbourne at the meeting where it will be presented. So that's why I'm in a hurry from, to go from here away. And, but also, experts who agree that there is a problem with, with uh, brain cancer and it might be caused by cell phone radiation, they are also having diverse opinions. Leonard Hardell, very well-known uh, epidemiologist from Sweden, thinks that it should be in group one, so this is carcinogenic to humans. I consider that it, we have enough evidence already for group 2A, meaning probably carcinogenic. But for example, Oleg Grigoryev, head of so-called Russian ICNIRP, thinks that we don't have enough evidence for 2A classification. So even those scientists who agree on, on in principle, that there is some problem with brain cancer, still disagree how certain is this evidence. But if we are thinking on epidemiology, so these studies in, in human populations, these case control studies, they support possible or probable cancer risk 
from brain can from cell phone radiation. In 2011, when IARC classified this radiation, we had only results from one large European study called Interphone and from Lennart Hardell in Sweden. Currently, we have four case control epidemiological studies that suggest cell phone radiation increases risk of developing brain cancer in avid users. And who is avid user? Avid user is a person who uses for 30 minutes per day for 10 years or longer. So 10 years every day, half an hour per day. This is avid user. But often you can read in newspapers, there is no problem for regular user. But who is regular user according to these epidemiological studies? They figured out that regular user is person who makes one phone call per week for six months. Try to get any cancer after this kind of exposure. So it would be like smoker smoking one cigarette per week for six months will not, never get lung cancer. So it means a regular tobacco smoker is, has no problem with brain cancer, with, with lung cancer. So those four studies on, on, that I mentioned, this case control studies, Interphone, Hardell, Serenad, this is French study, and Canadian part of Interphone, they say increase of risk of developing brain cancer is by 40, 170, 100, or 100% 100 again. But still, we have to remember, brain cancer is a rare disease. It is about 20 cases per 100,000 people. So it is very rare disease. So if we are taking, for example, this information, 100% increase in uh, brain cancer risk, so instead of 20 cases, we will have 40 cases of per 100,000 people. It will remain a rare disease. But there is also another information from Interphone analysis when they were analyzing where in brain brain cancer occurred and what was the most exposed to radiation part of brain. And they found correlation. Brain cancer was occurring in part of brain that was most exposed to cell phone radiation. But one thing what is important that all case control studies underestimate risk of brain cancer because they don't have really radiation dosimetry. They use surrogates. They don't know how much radiation, in fact, anybody was exposed to. And it is the problem. They have this surrogate, meaning they, they were asking how many minutes per day or month or week you were talking on cell phone. But when you live, in area where is good reception, meaning you are close to cell tower, your cell phone emits less radiation than when you are living in poor reception area and your cell phone has to emit more radiation in order to com communicate with cell tower. Therefore, two persons, one in poor field, one in good field, talking for the same length of time, were exposed to very different doses of radiation. But those persons with dramatically different radiation exposure were analyzed as if having the same exposure because they spoke for the same length of time, for the same number of minutes. And therefore, this information concerning or com comparison with, with cancer uh, exposure, uh, exposure with, with cancer has been uh, leading to underestimation because it was averaging. But, of course, this applies to current 3G and 4G technology. How it will apply to 5G microcells, this nobody knows. There are, of course, other studies like epidemiological cohort studies or trend studies showing that whether there is increase in whole population of number of brain cancer cases. And the trend data, for example, from US were sh showing slow rise in, in brain cancer cases, which were agreeing with Interphone prediction, so this 40% increase in, in risk, uh, but not with Hardell prediction, it, this 170% risk. 
But there are also other studies like Danish cohort and million women study that didn't even have this kind of poor exposure uh, data, like how many minutes person spoke. In Danish cohort, this exposure data was based on for how many years you had contract with your cell phone provider. So that was defining how much you, uh, you were exposed to radiation. I published article on this and, and if somebody is interested can find it. And million women study that was also very, very funny, very special study. The study was designed to study uh, effects of hormones on menopausal women, so women of certain age, when hormonal therapy was used to, to help them with, with health problems. But then somebody got genius idea, let's ask them about their cell phone use and we will have another study on cell phone use. So they did it. They asked whether you never, less than once a day or every day, use your cell phone. This was their information on exposure to cell phone radiation. That's simply a joke. And no wonder that in this kind of studies, like Danish cohort, million women study, result is negative. No effect. Then, of course, there is also issue that if, it, if there is brain cancer is being caused, is there something happening that this radiation causes mutations, is genotoxic, it damages DNA. And there are studies indicating that DNA damage can be detected either in cells or in animals exposed to wireless radiation. But the fact that we have this DNA damage, it not automatically means that this radiation is genotoxic. Because DNA damage occurs also spontaneously and is being repaired. When we are sitting here and being here in our cells, is appearing damaged DNA. So meaning there are errors in, in replication of DNA and we are getting damaged DNA. But this damaged DNA is very efficiently repaired. But in this case, we don't know whether radiation caused damage to DNA or whether radiation caused slowdown of repair processes. So whether this damaged DNA is really damaged or whether it is spontaneously occurring DNA, damaged DNA that is not repaired because the repair processes have been slowed down. And of course, one very important thing is we don't know what is uh, happening with this DNA that is damaged. It has not been studied. All studies were done to the point we expose, we measure how much there is damaged DNA, end of story. But in order to do something, this, this damaged DNA to be meaningful physiologically, it has to be transferred to next generation of cells. If it is not, who cares? Cells may die, the cells may repair this DNA, only then when it is transferred to living next generation of cells, then it can be a problem. And also, we don't know whether it occurs in humans. It occurs in cells grown in laboratory, it occurs in mice, but nobody studied in, in humans, so we don't know. And so, so, considering the efficiency of DNA repair mechanisms, claims that mobile phone radiation is genotoxic are, are not yet proven. It, we don't know. Okay. Then, of course, there is a big, big question that we have. Brain cancer trends and cell phone usage trends do not match. We always can see this kind of curve. Telecoms very much like to present it. Usage of cell phones skyrocketing, whereas brain cancer is flatline, almost flatline. So there is no match. So we have huge increase in cell phone use over the case, but not equally dramatic brain cancer rise. And why? And I think it is because, because we are different. And one 
at least this is my opinion, that health of the majority of human population will not be affected by exposures to EMF. We are, as humans, very resilient biological machines. We can take a lot of insults to our biological functions and we still are here on Earth. We rather, we faster we damage this Earth than Earth damages us. So only individuals with higher sensitivity to EMF will be affected. And this individual sensitivity, of course, can be modulated also by other environmental factors. So this is what kind of genes we have, in what kind of circumstances we live, this all can affect how we respond to this radiation. And here is some corroborating observations that support this hypothesis. In epidemiology, brain cancer was rare disease and according to these epidemiological studies will remain a rare disease because only highly sensitive persons respond and develop brain cancer. Toxicology, that was animal study that was done in, in US National Toxicology uh, Program in US, which is very stringently controlled what and how is done in those, those projects. Exposed animals, they were exposed to huge doses of EMF, this kind of doses that humans will never be exposed. But only few rats developed brain cancer, altogether all developed cancer. Out of 90 animals, few, half a dozen, developed problem. So even though all of them were exposed to these huge doses, because only highly sensitive animals responded, so there were some differences between those rats that some of them responded, the rest didn't, even though they got this huge dose, lifetime exposure. So they were from being babies until they died, they were exposed continuously to this radiation. And problem is that we don't know who might be more than average sensitive to EMF, and we don't study it, because any attempts to make biochemical research looking how people respond to this radiation on biochemical, molecular level, are being blocked. So, uh, here is this, that individual sensitivity to EMF, uh, this phenomenon that I'm suggesting that exists, is including this, what we know as electromagnetic hypersensitivity, but it has much broader meaning. And this, that electromagnetic hypersensitivity and individual sensitivity to EMF, they exist, and explanation is in one of my reports published on my website. So this is what I think that ICNIRP and WHO claims that individual sensitivity to EMF do not exist. This is false. And psychology research that has been used to date to study individual sensitivity is not good method, is inadequate to prove physiological effects. When we only ask people, how do you feel? Do you feel something? One of the main arguments is for those scientists who use psychology to, to study individual sensitivity is that people, when being claiming to be sensitive, when they are exposed to radiation, they cannot recognize when they are exposed to radiation and they, when they are not. Well, try to recognize when you are exposed to ionizing radiation, try to recognize when you are exposed to ultraviolet radiation, you never can. So this argument is completely, completely non-scientific. And there are many problems. This is table from, from my report from 2018, uh, what I mentioned earlier, but major problem in all these studies, psychological studies, when people were asked, volunteers, come to lab, 
being exposed or being not exposed and ask questions, how do you feel, do you have any symptoms and so on and so forth. Major problem is that nobody can diagnose this disease because there are no diagnostic methods. Therefore, anybody who came to lab and said, I have EHS, it is self-diagnosed. But those symptoms might have been caused either by radiation or maybe by something else, some chemicals in own environment. And therefore, scientists who are making these studies don't know if volunteers participating in the study, study have correct self-diagnosis of EHS. So it, in extreme case, might be that there was 20 volunteers and none of them had really EHS. But then, after experiments, they say, well, EHS doesn't exist because those people don't know anything about exposures to radiation. But maybe in the first place they didn't have. So there are some, some important studies that suggest that probable carcinogen classification should be used. In epidemiology, those additional studies from France and from Canada, and for interphone study showing localization of glioma in most exposed part of brain. There are animal studies showing tumor promotion of cell phone radiation plus chemicals. This in 2011 animal evidence that supported uh, classification was coming from studies where animals were exposed to cell phone radiation and some other type of radiation or some chemicals together. So this has been reconfirmed that this kind of uh, co-effects exist. There's, of course, one Chinese study, new study, showing leakage of blood-brain barrier and its impact on cognition in rats. And dosimetry, uh, there is re-evaluation of dosimetry in such a way that it came out that radiation doses that have been used so far in all in vitro experiments were too low in comparison to this, what real human being cells in our tissues feel when they are exposed to cell phone radiation. So they should be, at least many of them should be uh, uh, repeated with higher doses. And of course, question is when to invoke precautionary principle. And this is fragment definition from this European document uh, describing precautionary principle. And here is <coughs> mentioned that when the scientific information is insufficient, when there are possible effects on whatever environment, human, animal, plant life, and this can be potentially dangerous and also is inconsistent with the chosen level of protection. So if we go through those few steps, Scientific information is insufficient, inconclusive, or uncertain. And this is definition of class 2B carcinogen by IARC. It is the 2B classification means that science is insufficient, inconclusive, and uncertain. So first condition is fulfilled. There are indications that the possible effects on human health might be potentially dangerous. Well, brain cancer is potentially dangerous. And finally, we have this inconsistent with the chosen level of protection. Our level of protection is compliance with safety guidelines that all our cell phones have. So meaning any phone that you have in your pocket is in compliance with safety limits. So meaning it should be safe to your health. But epidemiological studies showing increased risk in avid users were generated in populations using regular cell phones like ours that are compliant with the current safety standards. It means that current safety standards are insufficient to protect users because when you use for a long period of time this safe cell phone which is compliant with safety limits, your risk of developing brain cancer is increasing. So the safety standards are insufficient. Then, when we continue on, on 5G and this part of, of 5G, which will be not anymore 3G and 4G, but we are going into millimeter waves, there is a lot of confusion because 
5G is being developed and deployed at the same time. Not every technology, not every even standards, how it will be operating, what will be happening with 5G are already known. They are being just developed. But anything that is ready is being deployed, not waiting for development of, of other parts. So even the technical standards dealing with 5G are not all ready yet when we are already deploying this technology. There is big rush to deploy it. And of course 5G, this millimeter waves and skin, that millimeter waves are absorbed only in skin. This is very often heard mantra from telecoms. Well, this is no problem. It will be only absorbed in skin. 3G and 4G radiation was penetrating through our, our body, deep in, inside our body. So then maybe something. But with millimeter waves, they will be absorbed only in skin. But skin is the largest organ of human body. We don't think of, about this very often, but it is. It is involved in regulation of immune response, very important, and generates mediators affecting nervous system. With proper action on skin, you can affect brain. We have lack of science on human skin response to millimeter waves. We have only one study on biochemistry, but it has been done it's in my lab, but on 3G technology. We don't have anything on 5G. Um, of course, this, this uh, radiation is deposited solely in skin. And one important thing, ICNIR is planning to classify skin as limbs. Because our body, for, for reasons of safety and exposure, is divided into head and trunk, which are important because they contain important uh, organs for our life. And there are limbs, hands, legs, because they are less important for our life. And that's why trunk and head can be exposed to lower level of radiation, whereas limbs can be exposed to higher level of radiation. And that's, what, that's why when you keep cell phone in your hand, it is still in compliance with safety limits because this is limp and can be more exposed to radiation than your rest of your body. If you often are thinking, all right, but I'm putting this cell phone to my head. So it means that, am I breaching this compliance? No, because there is also ear, earlobe, is considered as extremity, as a limb. So it is considered that ears are less important, these earlobes can be exposed to higher dose of radiation, so you can put your cell phone to your ear, and ear provides spacer between cell phone and your brain, so this, that the cell phone is a little bit further from your brain. But this is what, what uh, Ichnir now plans, that to say that skin, whole skin, will be classified as limbs. What it means, this radiation, millimeter waves, is absorbed only by the skin, by nothing else. But classifying whole skin as limbs, it permits that it can be exposed to higher doses of radiation because this technology needs it. So that's why it is being done. There, of course, industry knows about the skin and what's the importance of skin, but they somehow do weird things. Here was conference in 2014, Brooklyn 5G Summit, already then, sponsored by, by Nokia at New York University, and they produced article safe for generations to come, meaning 5G will be safe for generations to come. But at the same time, when reading text of the article, there is clearly said that relatively little careful research has been conducted evaluating the potential of more subtle long-term effects than tissue damage due directly to heating at millimeter wave frequencies. So on one hand, they are saying that will be safe for generations to come, no worries. But at the same time, they admit, but we don't have research. It is what it is says, that we, we don't have research to base this assumption or this claim, say, of safety 
own. And of course, there is in the same article, you can read later, I'm running out of time, uh, different quotes about this, how this uh, absorption by skin can affect health and indicating how little we know about, about this uh, absorption. Besides this, that skin has our skin cells, human skin cells, there is also plenty of other things. Namely, there is all, one thing is what is important for skin is this immune functions that it regulates in, in your body. But another thing is it is host for microbes. We have enormous amount, a number of different kinds of microbes living in us, on us, on our skin, in our guts, that only now science is learning that they are very important in regulators for physio normal physiology of human body. If we deplete them, we are getting sick. And also on skin, those microbes are living. And this, why well, doesn't, okay. So, when I looked recently for studies on skin effects of 5G, I made some, some searches in different databases. And what I found, that there were, to date, published 11 studies on human volunteers. All of them are small studies. There are 26 studies on human cells grown in laboratory. There are animal in vivo studies in rat and mice, 56 such studies. Animal cells, 10 studies. Total, about 103 studies. And most of them are small. If exposure is for long periods of time and non-thermal, we don't know how skin cells will respond to deposited energy. We didn't do this kind of research. We don't know long term. These are always acute exposures. So claims that we know skin will not be affected, as well as claims we know skin will be affected, are premature based on the available scientific evidence. We don't have science to say yes or no. We simply don't know how skin will respond to millimeter waves. We have some indications, but we don't know. If we are looking at those human volunteer studies, those 11 studies, what I found, there might be, and likely are, some differences in skin response depending on location of the skin on the individual's body. So different uh, uh, skin on your head or skin on your inside arm and other parts, they are behaving slightly differently. So they will have different uh, responses. And uh, there are also differences in the individual skin properties. Some of us have more dry skin, which will be not absorbing so much of microwaves. And some of us have well hydrated, moist skin, which will be, for example, absorbing more microwaves. So there is also a su suggestion from these studies that health status of the skin, so whether you have any skin diseases, can affect responses to millimeter waves. But summa summarum, we have no clue what will happen to human skin exposed for a long time to millimeter waves. We have no studies to prove any, any effect or no effect. So the scientific basis for the current claim of human health safety from the 5G exposures of skin is this. So questions, where is the science? It has not been done yet. These few studies is not enough. And here is something about microbes. There are also at different frequencies of millimeter waves done studies, also very few studies. And functions of, of microbes, bacteria, can be affected by millimeter waves in those studies. But this is not enough studies to prove that those effects really exist. Fact that one scientist finds something, it is not yet proved. Few others must repeat and find the same uh, thing for us to, to, be, uh, to believe in this. 
Then, of course, there is sensitivity of insects. This, here is a very good study that has been done uh, uh, in, in Belgium and published last year. They looked at how cell tower radiation from cell towers, from antennas of 5G, how it will affect insects. And they came, out, came up with, with answer that temperature of body of insect will increase slightly. They will not be cooked. They will not be badly affected. But this temperature rise will be enough to affect normal physiology of this animal. So this insect will misbehave, will not do this what normally would do. So for example, bees can forget what pollination is. Then, of course, there, is, there are questions about trees. Many people are concerned about trees. We have some anecdotal evidence and claims, but no scientific research studies. Fact that, for example, on the internet you can find anything and everything. So fact that side of the tree is dying on the side facing cell tower is not a proof of cell tower radiation effect. Because usually they are in urban areas, and in ground there are different cables, whatever infrastructure what we put there. So roots of the tree might be hitting some obstacle underground and suffering. And as long as we don't do careful research to find out whether in any another way this health of this tree is affected, this is just anecdotal evidence. So research needs to be done before climbing effects. And of course, this what is known already, that densely growing trees will interfere with 5G millimeter waves and may hamper, for example, deployment of safe self-driving cars and trucks. So if you have street, which is alley, with lots of trees along it, it will be difficult to use it for self-driving vehicles. And for example, City of Sydney expressed concern to, to parliamentary committee there in Australia concerning uh, the, uh, just the self-driving cars that is it so that if we wish to have self-driving cars, so then telecoms tell us that we should cut out trees from our streets because they will be affected by this uh, self-driving cars. There are, of course, those limitations in, in research on 5G millimeter waves. There, are, there is very limited number of studies. Industry refers to some 470 studies, which are not only biological, but also technical studies. Uh, we, I found some 100 studies on skin. EMF portal, good database in Germany, and also a good database in, in Australia. They found some 100 studies, but EMF portal only technical. Uh, also found uh, biological studies. So there is altogether, there are very few studies, very few. Then is, we have this lack of studies examining human volunteers, only 11. Lack of studies on individual sensitivity, so whether different people respond differently, depending on health status, age, whatever. And there is lack of studies on chronic long-term exposure, because this is what we will be exposed. It's not that we will be for a few minutes, but we will be around the clock exposed to millimeter waves that will be sitting in uh, uh, as a microcell in our living room. Then we have also studies from very limited number of research groups. There is maybe a dozen of different research teams. So this is too little uh, to make this research believable. We need more research teams being involved and, and replicating, lack of replication we have of these studies. So some studies show effects, but nobody else has done replication to make uh, sure that really these original observations are correct. And vast majority of studies are done in animals and in vitro on cells grown in laboratory. What is 
of very limited use in defining human health policies and safety guidelines. This is information that is important as corroborating information, but we need studies on human volunteers. And of course, one thing I'm talking all the time about volunteers, what about epidemiological studies? Epidemiological studies are not possible at all as long as 5G networks are not deployed in full swing. So that there will be populations exposed to 5G networks. That's why we don't have any epidemiology. So it is premature to claim that 5G is safe or 5G is harmful. Because we have not enough published scientific research. We may suspect that some effects will take pl place, but sufficient research has not been done yet. This is our major problem with 5G. This precautionary principle should be applied to 5G because we have information that there can be some effects, but full-scale deployment of 5G in situation of complete uncertainty, what this radiation, what exposing people in close proximity to this radiation will do, this is reason to call for precautionary principle also for 5G, not only 3G and 4G, but also for 5G. And sometimes people say that, all right, those who want precautionary principle would like people to go to back, back to caves and so on, because everything is scary. No, precaution in use does not equal prevention in use. Not everything and everywhere has to be wireless. Quite a lot can be wired services and we don't need everything to be wireless. But there is, of course, strong opposition from telecom industry to precautionary principle because if, we, if precautionary principle is implemented in this European document, it's written that technology providers can be made responsible to prove their product is safe. So it's not the deployment of uh, technology using assumption that it is safe, but it will require proof that it is safe. It may be, te telecoms might be required to make more efficient, less radiation emitting technology, what of course costs money. And of course, it will lead to limiting current uncontrolled deployment of wireless networks that anybody anywhere can deploy wireless network and nobody is asking questions. And finally, this is what people are worried, implementation oops, sorry. Oops. of precautionary principle will create new knowledge through research because to make, to prove that product is safe or make more efficient uh, gadgets, it will require research. So there will be more work and more knowledge. And implementation will create new jobs in research and technology. Somebody has to perform this research and find out what's going on. So it is not going back to caves, but just shifting profits from one place to another. So we seem to be not learning anything from the past, because in the beginning, in 80s, wireless communication technology, cell phones that were developed by US Army were used, were became sold to, to civilians based only on this, that Food and Drug Administration in US allowed cell phones to be sold without pre-market testing for human health hazard using, as excuse, low power exclusion, meaning that was assumption that this low power will not cause any health effects. That was assumed in 80s. But 30 years later, in 2011, research has shown that cell phone radiation emitted by this gadget is possibly carcinogenic and who knows, maybe even more. So this earlier assumed lack of health hazard appears to be false. And fast forward to today, 5G technology is being deployed without prior testing for human health hazard because it is assumed 
that it is safe because it emits only very low level energy. A couple of years ago, when I was at the conference in Hangzhou in China, and I asked straight question to representative of Orange from France. Are there any experiments performed to test whether human health will be affected? He looked at me surprised and said, but it is low energy. So that was the only. So this future is unknown because research certainly will proceed with some speed faster or slower. There is not much research, but, uh, research money, but still will be seen, will be seen what 30 years from now will happen. And of course, there is, we have this multitude of red flags and better proof is needed. We can, we have this expression of genes and proteins, individual sensitivity, effects of co-exposures to chemicals and this radiation, effects on skin and, and of 5G, and also brain cancer, blood-brain barrier, Alzheimer's, DNA damage, fertility. So we have very many uh, red flags, indications that there are probable or possible health effects, but we still are not having enough proof that it is really happening and to what extent it is happening in human population. So conclusions, we have those several urgent research needs that were already mentioned earlier, but there is enough science to implement precautionary principle, as I was mentioning earlier. And of course, especially children should be protected from all unnecessary exposures. This might be right now very difficult because imagine putting limitations on usage of smartphones by children and try to take away from them those cell phones. Well, it would be kind of difficult. Then also, of course, we need to change the ways how EMF science is evaluated. We have to stop those private clubs and we need rather round table where people with really different opinions get together and argue and get some sort of consensus. It is possible IR 2011 was this kind of group of 30 scientists. We were having opinions, scientists with opinions that there is big danger. We had scientists with opinions that there is no problem whatsoever and from in between. And after two weeks of discussions, we came with 2B classification. That's possible, round table. And final conclusion, which is last, it is scientifically, ethically, and morally unacceptable to claim that technology is safe for human use when the technology has not been sufficiently examined for its possible effects on human health, especially in situations where earlier assumptions of human health safety were shown to be false. Thank you. <laughs>